Good evening. I call to order this meeting of the Washington County Board of Education and declare a quorum. This evening we have two young ladies from Clear Spring Elementary School, Megan Collins, a first grader, and Chloe Collins, a third grader. Megan and Chloe are going to lead us in the pledge and a moment of silence. Girls? Allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Chloe, Megan, welcome. Thank you for being here this evening and leading us in the pledge and the moment of silence. Do you have someone here this evening that you would like to introduce to us? Yeah. And the one in the blue is mom. <laughs> Next to her is grandma and then daddy. Oh. Hey, and do you have someone else, Megan, that you'd like to introduce? Not really. Not really? Oh. Well, who's, who's the lady behind dad and grandmother? Miss Palm. Oh, and who is she? The principal. Oh, she's the principal of Clear Spring Elementary. Well, welcome, Mom, Dad, Grandma, and Mrs. Palm. Megan and Chloe. What is wonderful about Clear Spring Elementary School? What I think is wonderful about Clear Spring Elementary is that all the kids there are very nice to me. And I enjoy learning about like the math and the science and social studies. Great. And I like learning. Learning. How wonderful. Yeah. What a great place to be, to learn. And what do you like to do outside of school when you're not at Clear Spring Elementary? What are some of your interests? Well, sometimes on the weekend, I would read. And after a while, I would maybe go outside and play and check with my bunny, because I have one. And her name's Sparkles. I wished for a white rabbit with pink eyes, and she does have pink eyes. Hey. <laughs> Did you want to answer? And I like to read. And you like to yeah. read. So you're both readers. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. My colleagues have anything that they would like to ask Chloe or Megan? You were telling us how many books you read this summer. Would you want to tell the audience? Me and Megan read over 40 books. Wow. Each. Wow. Each. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> Well, girls, thank you so much for being here this evening. We appreciate it. Thank you're you. welcome to stay, Mom, Dad, Grandma, Mrs. Palm. You're welcome to stay for the entire meeting. If you need to leave, that's fine, too. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, girls. Okay, our first agenda item is the approval of the agenda. Move for approval. Second. Thank you, Mr. Bickford. Mr. Stafford, any discussion? If not, we'll move to the vote. All those in favor of approving tonight's agenda? Okay. Six to zero with the student member concurring. We'll move to the approval of the minutes. Madam President, I move for approval of closed session minutes dated Tuesday, September 12th. 2017. Thank you, Mr. Bickford. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Stauffer. Is there any discussion, any additions or corrections to those minutes? Okay. We'll move to the vote. All those voting for the approval of the minutes? OK. 
Okay, five. Anyone opposed? One abstention. Okay. Madam President, I move for approval of the second closed session minutes dated Tuesday, September 12, 2017. Thank you, Mr. Bickford. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Murray. Are there any additions or corrections to those minutes? Okay, we'll move to the vote. All those voting for approval of those minutes, please. Okay. Five approving the minutes. Any abstentions? One abstention. And the student member concurs. Thank you. Madam President, I move for approval of business meeting minutes dated Tuesday, September 12, 2017. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Murray. Any additions or corrections? Okay. Those voting for approval of the minutes? Okay. Five in approval. One abstention. And the student member concurs. Okay. Thank you. We'll move to public comment. We have three individuals signed up in advance this evening. Um, before I call the first person on the list, I'd like to read from Board Policy KD, which addresses the opportunity for public comment at board business meetings, town meetings, public hearings, and the procedures governing such proceedings. Each person wishing to address the Board of Education is encouraged but not required to sign up prior to the meeting and may address any topic concerning Washington County Public Schools except personnel or student matters which clearly identify an individual or individuals. Each speaker may speak for up to five minutes. The first individual we have who has signed up in advance is Mr. Greg Smith. Mr. Smith, would you like to come forward? Good evening. Good evening. Yep, any one of those will work. Um, the reason I decided to come this evening is that uh, I have two children that attend uh, an elementary school in Washington County. <coughs> and uh, last week and this week, we've gotten some letters sent home regarding the uh, um, cupcakes, food, stuff like that in the classroom and or, so this isn't a new topic. <laughs> um, and getting that, it kind of frustrated me. I understand that you know, there's some things back and forth, but then I open up their lunch thing and I see they're spending a dollar plus a day on ice cream and cookies <coughs> on top of the pack lunch we have. Uh, took my daughter to school on Monday and she's in a school where they get the free lunch, I mean the free breakfast, and uh, serving them Pop-Tarts. So I'm, you know, we're I was told it was about a health initiative more, I don't know what the right word is I want to use on it, but just a little frustrating. More than talking to some of the parents, you know, I ran into one lady who was in tears out in the parking lot. And we started talking, and she was telling me that was a highlight of her son's year, birthday is because they don't have a lot of money. She does it for parties for it. She celebrates it with the classroom with cupcakes or stuff. Now we're asking her to go out and buy trinkets and toys and other things that aren't where she can spend $2.50 on a cake and a... Um, Icing and makes the kid cupcakes. So I just, uh, I'm concerned about that. And again, if that's the rules, it's the rules. But then, you know, what if somebody decides they want to take their child at lunchtime and walk up to the lunch counter and say, let's buy 30 ice creams for everybody at the uh, lunch table and sing happy birthday to you? There's nothing that keeps them from doing that. So I'm just trying to figure out what we're trying to accomplish because it's clear I get the school board or the school systems taking my hard earned money to put sugar in my kid's mouth. But we can't let them celebrate and have a Valentine's. I mean, not Valentine's. I wonder what they're going to do. They give out, uh, you know, val trade Valentine's, and I don't, do any of them even not have candy in them? I mean, I don't know that I've ever seen one. So I'm just trying to figure out what's the best way to accomplish a the disappointment in the majority of the students in there, and the teachers that are frustrated. This, you know, the community is frustrated, and you know, how do we get more involved in these committees? Because I'm sure more parents knew that something like this was going on, you'd have a lot more involvement, maybe some different members on the committee that could have offered a different variety of options. I mean, I've checked some other schools. I mean, I'm hearing that everybody's kind of doing some of the similar things. But, you know, the parents aren't being involved in these decisions. It's a committee. 
we're sitting back and saying, okay, that's what they decided. They decided, I think we could do more than that as parents to step up and take the people that we've asked to represent us in our school board to speak more for us and less for what society's trying to push them into. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. It's, it's not the board's practice to address um, individuals as they speak. They're, the next sesh, the next portion of the agenda is for board members' response to public comment. So when we've heard all our speakers, if there's someone here who would like to respond, they will. And I'm thinking perhaps the superintendent might sure. have something that he would like to say. Okay, thank all right. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, the next individual is Pam Faulkner. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. And let me start by saying that Mr. Bickford did a wonderful job last night at the Taste of the Town. So I think I would get my compliments out of the way and maybe get one person smiling before I start. Uh, my name is Pam Faulkner. I live in Westfields. Uh, and my granddaughters attend school in uh, one at South High and one at Williamsport. I was here last month at your last meeting, whichever that was, and I did I came because I was interested in the, um, the debt of the school lunch program, and then while I was here, I heard the potential solution of hiring the collection agency and became alarmed and decided that perhaps there was something I might be able to do to help with that. I've been a teacher. I'm a retired teacher now. I was a teacher for 40 years. I taught in West Virginia in several counties there. I taught in Covington, Virginia, and in Spartanburg, South Carolina. So I have a lot of experience in the school system, and I know pretty much that sometimes our hands are tied. However, um, I've been here for three years in your wonderful school system, and I'm here really because of you. Because when my son and daughter-in-law decided to get married, it was move the girls to West Virginia or move my son and I up here. And here we are, because Washington County Schools was a great school system, is a great school system, and we really wanted the girls to stay here. Um, when I heard about the deficit, I tried to figure out what I could do. Um, I had some experience recently with a GoFundMe campaign, which is an online sourcing campaign, and immediately thought that perhaps that was a solution uh, now I'm not sure, but I, I would like to suggest that to you and suggest that if there is a way to do any kind of fundraiser to help with this problem, I would be glad to volunteer, to coordinate it, run it, do whatever I can to see that happen. Um, I have a petition that I put online and have 196 signatures of people who are responding to just asking the board if you will consider some other solution other than hiring a collection agency. I have the names of those people. Now I ask those people only to sign if they were residents of, of Washington County, Maryland, but uh, we had a few people who were overexcited and some people from Seattle thought they would state their opinion <laughs> and some people from Pennsylvania. So. We have all kinds, but most of them, at least 100 of them, um, probably 150 of them are from Washington County. And so I would like to present that to you. Also, I have the comments that people made uh, when they signed and for you to look at, and also an article about a gentleman in Seattle who did raise uh, for his school systems, same thing, for his school systems public budget for public lunches, and he raised uh, an incredible amount of money, not quite as much as we need, but I believe that we have a lot of people here who are good people, people who care about this school system, who would be happy to help if there were a way they could do that. Ms. Williams, would it be okay if I absolutely, hand these out to you? Absolutely. And thank you very much for listening to me this evening. Thank you, Mrs. Faulkner. See, we're all smiling. Yes. <laughs>
thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. And the next person signed up is Mr. Neil Becker. Mr. Becker. Good evening. Maybe I can make Peter smile because I got to participate in Taste of the Town with Peter, and it was a lot of fun. We sold a lot of and we raised a lot of money for uh, an, an incredible organization. Um, but good evening, President Williams and board members and Dr. Michael. Thank you for the opportunity to address the board tonight. I wish I could say just two words. Kerwin Commission. And every educator and every parent in Washington County would understand how important the commission's work is to the future of education, not just here in Washington County, but throughout the state of Maryland. So in just a few words tonight, I can barely touch the surface. Folks can Google it. They can find it on Facebook pages. It's, it's throughout um, that cool thing of the internet that's out there. And they can identify locations and find all sorts of things about the Kerwin Commission. Most importantly tonight, I'd like to share that there is a public meeting at Frederick High School at 6.30 p.m. on Thursday. Maryland's public schools are underfunded by nearly $3 billion. Billion with a B. That's an average of about $2 million per school. Imagine what materials, what programs we could offer in Washington County with those millions. Imagine the improvements and the updates to the infrastructure and the buildings that we could accomplish, that we could perform on those buildings with, well, if we have $2 million of school, you know, it's almost $100 million. It's a lot of money. About two-thirds of every dollar that we get, that Washington County gets from the state, um, or excuse me, of funding that we need to run our schools from the state, about two thirds. A few years ago, that number was about 50% with the county commissioners sharing the load, the other half of that load. The time is now for all educators, all elected officials to speak up for our students. If Kerwin is funded, if the commission is successful in doing and completing its mission, special education services such as speech, PT, OT, could be enhanced and increased throughout our county. Every school could get full-time guidance counselors, maybe more than one guidance counselors, full-time in every school. Smaller class sizes and parapros throughout the buildings would be the norm and not the exception. Our school system has been physically sound, conservative to do everything it can to stretch out the dollars, but now there just aren't enough dollars. With the Kerwin Commission, there could be enough. There would be enough dollars to fund everything we need to fund. I look forward, I've already contacted Dr. Michael, I look forward to working with you, the elected board, with the administration, the executive staff, as we communicate our needs to the commission and throughout the community with our elected representatives, because together we can garner what we need, what our students need, so that they can achieve and achieve at a high rate. So thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, Mr. Becker. <clears throat> Is there anyone else in the audience who has not had the opportunity to sign up prior who would like to make public comment this evening? No? We have an opportunity then for board member response to public comment. Any of my colleagues have anything they wish to say? Would you like to say something, Dr. Michael? Wayne. Oh, go ahead. Yes. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Obviously, you know what my position is on that. I don't think we need a funding, a fundraiser. To take care of this. I think that our people are smart enough to figure out a way to make this work. Um, <clears throat> and the gentleman who was concerned about the cupcakes, um, I think I made that point last meeting that I was a little bit concerned that that seemed over the top. Um, 
you know, that is something that kids look forward to and have looked forward to for a long time. I don't see that that should be, I don't think that, that as I said earlier, that one cupcakes, you know, is gonna change the, uh, the health and, and well-being of our kids uh, during the course of a year. So I, you know, I support where you're coming from and appreciate you coming forward and, and um, giving your opinion on this so that, that our staff and my, my fellow board members would um, also take those things into consideration. So thank you for showing up. I appreciate it. Any others? Dr. Michaels? Okay. Well, I'd like to just comment on all three speakers. Mr. Smith, I certainly appreciate um, your concern about the cupcakes and what appears to be something very simple. This uh, has been discussed for a number of years uh, about food and outside food brought into the classroom. It sounds simple, but it's actually a fairly complicated situation. When the committee that studied our wellness uh, issues got together and they studied this over a long period of time and brought recommendations, I asked a number of similar questions about is it really necessary to cut out this or to do that. Uh, and it, over time, I've been convinced that it is appropriate to cut out uh, outside food coming into the classrooms for a number of reasons. Again, it seems like a simple cupcake, but when you multiply it times 20 birthdays in the room, suddenly we have 20 cupcakes. I feel a little foolish to talk about cupcakes, but and 20 parties and lost time. But more importantly than that to me is things were described to me. 75% of our EpiPen uh, needs or our allergic reactions to food allergies have come from outside food being brought into the classroom. So as we look at that as a serious health concern, um, I, I felt that it was necessary to rule out something like that. Beyond that, uh, that wellness committee shared with me, students often will recognize that something brought in is something that they're allergic to. So they choose not to eat uh, the item, which is certainly uh, wise on their part, but now they're excluded from the party in a sense. Everyone else is participating by eating cupcakes, um, but here a child's off to the side, they might have a severe allergy to it, might even have to leave the room. Um, so between health risk, you know, again, we're fighting obesity issues. On one hand, we're being begged and pushed and prodded by everybody to deal with obesity uh, and take on all the roles and responsibilities of parents. I just encourage parents, look for other means, have parties at home, those types of things, family, friends, invite the children over, whatever that might be, uh, and we'll just focus on what we need to do in the classroom. We wanna have fun, we wanna uh, celebrate children's birthdays when it's appropriate, uh, but I am concerned about the health risk, you know, fighting obesity, uh, also the time that we often lose with some of that. In response to uh, Mrs. Faulkner, I really appreciate your efforts and willingness to volunteer and go fund me. Uh, I think this is still a decision to be made by the board. They're still working on their uh, second read of the policy. Um, Mr. Prue came to me several years ago with this idea when I was deputy superintendent. We didn't move forward with it. I need to make it absolutely clear to the community. This is not for people who can't afford to pay. The debt collection agency, if it's even determined by the board to be used, would be for people who can afford to pay. We just go to incredible ends, and I just credit staff with all the work they do to work with parents, to work with grandparents, to work with guardians, uh, to help people fill out their free and reduced meal applications, to work with people who've had a serious health issue in their family or a crisis or a lost job or anything like that, even if people aren't eligible for free and reduced meals. We would not pursue people with a credit agency uh, for people who have, don't have the means to pay. This is for people now, this is kind of a new development for the last couple of years, where people are just choosing not to pay. And it appears to be a growing issue. So that would be, that's staff's recommendation, but this is a decision yet to be made by the board. And Mr. Becker, you know that I'm going to the Kerwin Commission on Thursday and will speak on behalf of uh, Washington County Public Schools. We're certainly gonna be advocating for uh, additional pre-K support uh, for Washington County. Also, that Washington County, um, it's a fair share of whatever pie is determined to be added to uh, the state budget. Um, we believe it's very important. Sometimes we've lost out on some of these formulas as it's more uh, been more favorable to other counties. So those will be the types of comments that I'll be making on Thursday. Thank you. 
Mr. Adamant. Yeah, just in, with all res due respect to, to, to the superintendent, I still don't buy some of this. And I apologize, but I don't. You know, um, the argument that, you know, having used cupcakes, keep using cupcakes as an example, to bring cupcakes in is, um, you know, it's, it's lost class time. I'm not sure that, you know, a, a break like that isn't, isn't something that improves classroom performance. With respect, you know, if you read the model for Finland, as far as their school day is concerned, it's significantly shorter than ours. You know, they have mandated four breaks during the course of the day. You know, it, so it, it's, there are a hundred reasons that I could give you, and I'm sure you could give me another hundred back. Um, I don't believe that that's a big deal. You know, is, is there a chance? Yes, if uh, we, we'd have to, parents would have to make certain that, you know, that there are not food sources that are going to be dangerous to anybody. Um, I think if we're going to, you know, I think the, the one argument about the Pop-Tarts, you know, are we going to say, okay, breakfast, we can't offer Pop-Tarts or ice cream, we can't have that as, a, as an extra thing that they can buy? You know, where do we draw the line? You know, um, it's just, again, I, you know, I, I find that we try to get involved sometimes too much. Um, I, I have spoken to Frederick County as far as the, the school lunch debt is concerned. They do not have collection agency as part of their policy. Wicomico County doesn't have it as part of their policy. You know, and Frederick County, for example, I think their, their uh, debt number is $3,400. They send on letters, they send on emails, they send on stuff in a backpack to remind parents you still have an outstanding debt. Um, I just think it, it, it reflects badly on us. If we put in a policy, we're going to sick a you know, collection agency on you if you don't pay. You know, that's not, I don't think that's what I want to be about. You know, I, know, I don't think that's what the board and, and the school system should be about. So I'll continue to argue against that. And I will continue to say, you know, Letting kids have a treat once in a while is not a bad thing as far as the system is concerned. I don't think it compromises Washington County Public Schools in any way. So thank you for listening, Dr. Michael. You may not like what I'm saying, but you know, that's, that's how I feel. Mr. Stauffer. Uh, yes, about the uh, <clears throat> collection agency thing, I think that was blown way out of proportion uh, by individuals because that I'm on the policy committee and the thing of it is with the new policy or with the new program no child is going to be denied a meal uh, as Dr. Michael has cited these are people who can pay but don't pay and they would be the ones who would be going after if the last ditch effort were used there would be all kinds of attempts made to uh, get them to pay before that was ever used. And I don't have a problem with uh, having it uh, somewhere, either in the regulations or in the policy, uh, for that to occur. Berkeley County, West Virginia has it in. Uh, they've got uh, some uh, programs that work over there for the collection of that money. And uh, uh, this is an ongoing process. Uh, the policy committee has, uh, Really, I haven't gotten any concerns to me, uh, either through email or anything, uh, about this issue at all. And uh, I just think it's been blown way out of proportion. Uh, we're not going after people who don't have the ability to pay. No child is going to be hurt by this program. Not one single child. I want to make that perfectly clear. say something I, I want to say something about the cupcake issue um, I understand what you're saying mr. Ridenour 
But as a person who has a gluten allergy, I also understand how those little children that can eat the cupcakes feel. And also the, the children with peanut allergies, they would probably have to leave the room. And you have 20 children in a classroom, that's 20 days of cupcakes. 20 times you'd have to leave the room, be excluded from the festivities. It's just the food that's brought in from outside. You can't guarantee that it's going to be safe for a student who has an allergy. And lots of kids might not even tell the teacher. The teacher has to be very aware because they want that cupcake. So it's just a concern. I understand it because I have that allergy and it's just safer not to have them all together. So it's Um, to, our, uh, to our speakers, I would say that neither one of those policies is under consideration this evening. Uh, we're not debating those policies at this time, but merely responding to your comment. But I think that um, you can see that a great deal of consideration and discussion is happening, has happened, and will continue to happen around those policies. So uh, as a member of the policy committee, I can tell you that um, it's good to hear your thoughts, so we appreciate you coming in here and making your thoughts known to us. And um, the discussion will continue, and we will do, uh, as a member of the policy committee, I can tell you that I will do my best to make the best possible decision, and then ultimately uh, it will be the vote of the board that decides where we land with the policy. Right. Anyone else? All right, so under old business, we do have some policies under consideration this evening. The first of which um, is policy JICI, the policy on the administration of overdose reversing medications, such as naloxone. Uh, this is the uh, consideration. This is the second reading of this policy. So, Mr. Trotta. Thank you. Good evening. During the Board of Education's public business meeting conducted on September the 12th, the Board approved the first reading of new policy JICI. The community has been requested to offer comments. We have not received any comments regarding this proposed policy. The Policy Committee is requesting the approval of the second reading of policy JICI. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trotta. Is there a motion? Yes, in the absence of Mrs. Fisher, the Policy committee, uh, committee Chair, who's uh, out of town uh, this week. I move to approve the second reading of proposed policy JICI entitled Policy on Administration of Overdose Reversing Medications such as Naloxone. Naloxone. N-A-L-O-X-O-N-E. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Stauffer. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Bickford. Discussion or questions? Tony, I, could you just explain, uh, because I know there's confusion in the public about what first reading and second reading means? Certainly. The, the board has a, a separate policy on the process to be followed with regard to the adoption of policies. And uh, the board has a first reading, at which time a proposed policy is introduced and explained and and we go into great detail during the first reading to explain the purpose uh, of, of the policy. And lately, most of those policy changes have been have resulted from the passage of legislation in Annapolis. So the, the first reading is an opportunity for board members to, to offer questions. We then post, uh, assuming the board approves the first reading, we post that online. And members of the community are, are, are requested, please submit comments to us so that we may consider those. We gather that information. We usually have the policy committee, which is composed of three members of the, of the Board of Education. They meet and examine and consider comments offered by the public. They also consider comments offered by members of the board during the first reading. Uh, that gives the, the policy committee an opportunity to consider whether additional changes are needed. Once that, that, that consideration of the various comments have been submitted, we then proceed to the second reading as we are here this evening. We report back to the board whether we have received any comments. We report back the recommendation of the policy committee. 
and assuming that the board approves the second reading, then the action, that becomes the action of the board. So, for instance, this evening, the policy that we just reviewed is, a, is a, an entirely new policy that's required under Maryland law that the board have a policy. And, and, and assuming you approve the second reading this evening, it will become effective. And um, what, what then happens after that process, in some cases, the superintendent may issue administrative regulations to further explain uh, the, the policy and to how, you, how we would carry out the policy. Uh, I'm going to have another second reading this evening, and that's going to be a little different in that in some cases we rescind a policy. The board will examine existing law or existing <coughs> policy or existing practices and determine that a policy is no longer needed. And, and once again, we go through the same process of a first reading, and there's a, a, a gap in between the first reading and the second reading so the community can offer comments. And we welcome those comments, as a matter of fact, and I think that they allow us to consider the policy a little bit more closely. And I think you'll oftentimes see between a first reading and a second reading some, some changes. And that's based upon the, the comments that we do receive from board members and the community. Thank you. Any other questions or any further discussion? Okay, then we'll move to the vote for approval of the second reading of proposed policy JICI all those in favor? Okay. I have five affirmative votes. And the student member concurs. Thank you. We have the second reading to rescind policy JD, school census. Thank you. When September the 12th, the Board of Education approved the first reading of the rescission of policy JD, we have not received any comments from the community. The policy committee is recommending the approval of the second reading of the rescission of this particular policy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trona. Is there a motion? I move to approve the second reading to rescind policy JD entitled school census. Thank you, Mr. Stauffer. Is there a second? Thank you, Mrs. Murray. Questions? Discussion? Seeing none, we'll move to the vote. The vote is on the approval of the second reading to rescind policy JD entitled school census. All those in favor? Five affirmative votes, and the student member concurs. Thank you, Mr. Trotter. Okay. We move to new business. Under new business, we are going to be taking two votes. Um, this evening. One on the approval of the agreement, the contract agreement between the Washington County Board of Education and the Washington County Educational Support Personnel for the 2017-2018 school year. And the other is to appro approve the contract agreement between the Washington County Board of Education and the Washington County Teachers Association for the 2017-2018 school year. So we'll take these two votes one at a time and then following the votes we'll have the signing um, down front. So at this time I'll entertain a motion for approval of the contract between Washington County Board of Education and the Washington County Educational Support Personnel. Inc. Looking for a motion. Pardon? I'm looking for a motion. I thought they were going to come on. Say something. <laughs> I'm looking for a motion. <clears throat> to approve the contract agreement between the Washington County Board of Education and the Washington County Educational Support Personnel uh, Incorporated for the 2017-2018 school year. Thank you, Mr. Stuffer. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Bickford. Discussion? 
questions? No? Okay. All those in uh, favor of approving this contract agreement between the Washington County Board of Education and the Washington County Educational Support Personnel, Inc. All right, five affirmative votes, and the student member concurs. Okay, I'm looking for another motion with regard to the contract agreement with the Washington County Teachers Association. Madam President, I move to approve the contract agreement between the Washington County Board of Education and the Washington County Teachers Association for the 2017-2018 school year. Thank you, Mrs. Murray. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Stauffer. Any discussion, questions? Move to the vote. All those in favor of approving this contract? Five affirmative votes and the student member concurs. And at this time I would like to um, invite Mr. Neil Becker of the Washington County Teachers Association, um, Ms. Ann Marie Hines, President of the Washington County Educational Support Personnel, Inc., and Mr. James Bowers, Chief, Negotiation, Chief Negotiator for that group. Okay. And this is Robin Spickler, a member of the negotiating team. Yes? No? A representative from the teaching ranks. Yes. Okay. Do you have comments before we do our signing? Uh, we would just like to thank the Board of Education. Uh, we're very pleased that we were able to come to an agreement. Uh, we'd like to recognize uh, the leadership of Dr. Michael and his staff, and we look forward to working together in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you. And not to plagiarize Anne Marie, but <laughs> ditto that. Um, it, it was a long and at times stressful process for both teams, but um, I am uh, very optimistic that we'll move forward uh, with the positive energy that we uh, finished up the session with under the guidance of uh, Dr. Michael and the board's uh, actions in recent weeks to move us forward. And I recognize uh, the Uniserve directors, Sean and Carlos, who helped us through the process, and our members who worked uh, tirelessly on surveys and evaluating materials and reviewing language from our team and from our board of directors. And I'm fortunate to have Robin with us tonight to help represent uh, our teachers. Thank you, Mr. Becker. Mr. Bowers, did you say anything? If you're going to put me on the spot, I'll also bring in, uh, I thank uh, the HR director, Terry Baker, and our new coup, Jeff Prue. Um, they both stepped up to the plate and um, put a lot of time and effort into this. Um, it was kind of a trying year. We lost a lot of time um, there with the departure of the old regime. So um, I, I know they spent more time across the table with myself and Anne Marie than what they probably wanted to. Thank you. Any of my colleagues have any comments that they would like to make? Well, I just want to say that 30 some years ago, Mr. Bowers, uh, Jimmy was a sitting in my government class in Williamsport High School, so good to see you up here, Jim. <laughs> Says how old you are. <laughs> I would just like to say how pleased I am that we were able to come to an agreement with both employee groups um, without having to go to impasse. It was um, a very long time of negotiations, I think almost a year, I think October, until our signing this evening. Um, so I'd like to thank both teams um, for their um, perseverance and uh, for their attempts at coming together to reach an agreement. So thank you.
what happens when you're retired and she is she's yeah, yes so again thank you thank you to the board members thank, thank you very much thank you thank you you don't want to keep the pens neil <laughs> Next agenda item is another policy, this one for first reading, to rescind policy JECF, Adult Admission to the Career Study Center. Mr. Trotter. Good evening. The Policy Committee has undertaken a review of Section J of the Policy Manual with the intent to rescind policies that are outdated or already addressed in state law. Policy JECF, which is entitled Adult Admission to the Career Study Center, was adopted in 1977. This policy sets forth a practice that no longer occurs. For this reason, the Policy Committee is requesting the Board of Education to approve the first reading of the rescission of this policy. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion? I move to approve the first reading to rescind policy JECF entitled Adult Admission to the Career Studies Center. Thank you, Mr. Stauffer. Is there a second? second. Thank you, Mr. Bickford. Questions? Discussion? All those in favor of the first read? To rescind policy J and C F. Five affirmative votes. And that brings us to another policy. Consideration of the first reading to rescind policy J F. Resolution relative to students' rights and responsibilities. Thank you. In 1978, the Board of Education adopted a resolution that sets forth the rights and responsibilities of students. Since 1978, the State Board of Education adopted an administrative regulation that requires local boards across the state of Maryland to have a document that sets forth the rights and responsibilities of students. It has been the long-standing practice of the Washington County Public School System to publish on an annual basis a, a book that is known as the Student Handbook and Guide. The handbook sets forth in great detail the rights and responsibility of students. This, this handbook is provided to parents and it's also available online. Based on its review, the policy committee concluded that policy JF is no longer needed and is being recommended that this policy also be rescinded. 
Thank you, Mr. Trotta. Is there a motion? I move to approve the first reading to rescind policy JF entitled Resolution Relative to Student Rights and Responsibilities. Thank you, Mr. Stoffer. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Murray. Questions or discussion? Okay, all those in favor of approving the first reading to rescind policy JF? Five affirmative votes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trotta. That brings us to the superintendent's report. Dr. Yeah. Michael. Thank you, President uh, Williams. This time I have uh, three reports I'd like to share with the board. We'll share one right after another in the interest of time. Uh, certainly provide you an opportunity to ask any questions between presentations. But our first report will be an update on our advanced placement and IB um, scores and feedback that we received from most recent testing in the spring. Um, Ms. Markovich and Dr. Reinhardt will share that report. They'll be after questions. They'll be followed by uh, Dr. Kahanik and Bob Alton. They're going to share a little bit about our digital learning plan 2.0 a little bit about the future of where we're going with our digital learning plan. And then following that will be Dr. Akers, uh, Matt Simler, and Jeff Crew. We'll do, give a little update on summer school and summer projects. With that, we'll turn it over to Dr. Reinhardt. President Williams, Dr. Michael, members of the board, uh, Dr. Reinhardt and I are presenting the uh, student achievement for advanced placement in International Baccalaureate tonight. We'll start with uh, advanced placement, or AP. Uh, you can see the uh, five-year trend with a number of different data points uh, represented by the light blue at the end. We had 2,723 students who were enrolled in AP courses. Out of those students, 2,119 in the red were the number of exams that were taken by those students. In the green, 1,043 had a score of three or higher, which is a passing score for AP. And we had 1,280 students that are the uh, individual test takers represented by those numbers. It's a similar graphic for IB. Again, 534 students were enrolled in IB courses at the end of the year. We had 260 exams represented in the red. 163 of those were passing scores. This is four and higher for IB. And this represents 101 different takers of these assessments. We also look at the number of participants of students who take uh, AP, IB, or both of the assessments. So out of 1,316 students that participated in these exams, 1,218 in the blue took AP exams. <clears throat> Green was uh, 44 students took IB exams. These are only offered at North Hagerstown High School. And 54 students participated in both IB and AP. When we look at the score distribution, again, um, AP is a five level test. A three and higher is considered passing. So you can see the green, the light green at 27.4% scored a three. 15.6% scored a four. 6.3% scored a five, which is the highest number. IB is a seven point scale. Four and above is passing for IB. 30.0% got a four. 23.5% scored a 5, 8.1% scored a 6, and 1.2% scored a 7. We did have some notable accomplishments for AP uh, tests this year, and uh, since you've already had these, I just want to recognize Boonesboro High School, South Hagerstown High, Williamsport High, Barbara Ingram, and then one more for Boonesboro at the bottom. So moving on to um, an update on the International Baccalaureate Middle Years Program. Um, the last time that I was able to present to you, we were, um, we had just been um, designated as candidate schools at Northern Middle and North Hagerstown High School. Um, we had the opportunity to unveil the middle years program last night at our all-county open house event 
for advanced academy, um, specialized CT, all specialized programs. And um, we have to say that the community has been very excited to see this new addition in that feeder pattern. And um, one of the things to note is that we feel it's going to provide a better pathway to the IB diploma program and also the IB career related program. Another initiative that we are really proud of is our partnership with Equal Opportunity Schools. Um, our four schools that you see there listed are joining just a few other schools in the state of Maryland in this partnership with Equal Opportunity Schools. Um, really, our mission is to continue to increase, increase the uh, diversity of our AP and IB populations, um, those students who are enrolled in those courses and who are taking those tests. Um, the population, of course, includes our students of color and students from low-income households. Thank you, with that, <clears throat> I think there's already a question from Mr. Ridener. I was going to say, um, appreciate the uh, attendance last night for advanced programs in general. It wasn't about AP or IB necessarily. It was partially about IB, but we had great attendance during the time I was there last night. And appreciate. Dr. Ryan uh, Hart's efforts in pulling that together last night, and all the staff that participated. The IB Middle Years program was well represented by Northern Middle School. I believe we had five or six staff members there, all dressed in red and promoting their new program. Yes, so. including Beth Ell's house. Mm -hmm. so Mr. Ryan, had a question. Mr. Ryan, just real quickly, the P, go to the, the last slide. It says Maryland 3 PG CPS. What's the? Georgia County Public oh, okay, schools. and then Montgomery County yes. Public Schools. Okay, all right. The other thing, how many total? Just a rough guess, but we, uh, Dr. Mike, excuse me. Okay, um, known you too long. How how many total high school students do we have in Washington County? What what's a rough guess? I'm uh, trying to we're do. We're starting my to get seven. larger classes moving into our high school, but about 1,600 per grade level. So <coughs> that would be about 54. Or 1,600 per grade level? Yes, a little over that. About a little over 5,000 kids. Five to 6,000. Okay. I'm, I'm, you know, it's fine, Dane. When will we see, is, is there any comparison, or is that still not ready for us yet? You know, how each school did, the number of kids that were taking it, how they, how well they did on the AP. Obviously, North High is the IB. Do we have that? data broken down we yet, do have that, that information we can provide it to the board in the Friday package. just out of kids a curiosity more than anything the other thing I, I still have and I think I've mentioned this to you guys before I, the, I have some concerns that you know the kids are getting pressured into taking AP in some of our schools who kids who may not really be um, ready or should be taking it um, I think we got to be. We have to be careful. You know, I know of my wife's school. There are kids taking six AP classes in their senior year. That's absurd. You know, they can argue, "Oh, I want to learn so much." That's too much. That is too much. It's it, you know, they're taking a college level, supposedly a college level course. You know, five days a week. You know, for 180 days. You know, that's a heck of a lot more time than a college student is, would put into that and they have less time to prepare because they're in school six hours a day. So, you know, I'm, I'm concerned we're overdoing it. I mean, I've heard rumors and I, I say this to you guys because I know you would con consider it, but the counselor should not be telling a kid that you can't take honors, you have to take uh, AP. That shouldn't happen. You know, parents and students should be, unless it's absolutely ridiculous what they're trying to do in their junior and senior year, you know, they should have the input. It shouldn't be the counselor. It shouldn't be me or anybody else. Uh, six, six classes is too much. You know, I don't think I've known in 40 years of being in public education, maybe five to ten kids who could do that without killing themselves. You know, and... Uh, so that still concerns me. Um, but the, the other thing, if I could see that sometime, I'd greatly appreciate it. 
Okay, thank you. Mr. Stauffer? Uh, I was just wondering, uh, how many schools actually ac accept a, a score of three for college credit uh, on the AP exams? Uh, I mean, I've read where a lot of schools don't take anything less than a four. Uh, do we have any idea? I mean, yeah, it, it really does vary by school. It varies by the, um, the level of competitiveness. You know, are they a top tier school? Um, certainly the top tier schools in the Ivy League schools, um, they want to see fours, if not yeah. all fives. But then it also does vary by the, the actual exam itself. So at some schools, they um, might accept credit for you know, a three or higher for an AP human geography. And at other schools, not, they would not accept that credit. So it does very much vary by the individual colleges, universities, and their, and their policies, as well as the level of, of, com, of competi competitiveness. Do we know how many kids received college credit from the test last year? Or do we have any statistics on that at all? No, we do not. That'd be interesting to know how many students actually do get college credit. Yes. I mean, I've, I've read stories through the years of students in some counties, you know, entering uh, college as a second semester sophomore and, and so forth. But there is plenty of data um, through College Board that shows that students who take, um, who sit in the course and take the exam um, are more likely to um, graduate college within four years. Yeah. So there's a lot of meaningful data out there about just the value of being part of a, an AP course and even just sitting for the exam. So I do have plenty of that, that data that I could supply to you. Yeah, and, and about the uh, teaching of the AP courses. I mean, in college, let's face it, if you enter the college classroom, you're going to get a lecture every day. Yeah. But if you're teaching an AP course in high school, you can't be a lecturer. You have to use other teaching methods and so forth. I mean, it, it's just, it's a college level course, but still the atmosphere for teaching is much different. Okay. Anyone else? <coughs> Thank you, bye-bye. Pat Hennigan, Stralton, please. Good evening, President Williams, Vice President Stauffer, Superintendent Dr. Michael. I'd like to thank you for the privilege to update you on the digital learning plan that has been instituted for just over one year now, starting on our second year this year. The organization of this meeting is in the second slide, which shows you that we're going to review multiple surveys that were provided to staff and students, listening sessions, in which incorporated also Dr. Michael's listening tour and efforts to support feedback in the overall response to those, those things that were provided to us. The first part is the student survey. Approximately 25% of these students participate, or the students in Washington Public Schools that are in grades three to 12 participated in this survey. And here's a breakdown of the levels for each. Pretty equitable across the board. The next question was whether or not they have concerns uh, with the iPad or the digital learning plan. And I will say that the primary concern voiced by students across all levels was the restricted sites followed by typing, the capacity to type. It also showed that there's strong iPad use prevalent daily and in most classes, specifically in the elementary and middle school. When the students were asked about the device or if they would prefer the different device or accessory, about half of them stated they would prefer an accessory or device. When those half were then asked why or what they would prefer, the majority of those selected MacBook or keyboard for an iPad. And when asked why they would want a different device, the majority cited typing as the number one concern. Mike, what, excuse me, what did you say, the last thing you just said? That what was the number one cited, concern? I'm sorry, uh, which part? The majority typing was the number one concern Thank on why they selected a different device. These next two slides show that the students use the device for an array of resources and efforts. A lot of this aligns to what we call substitution, 
in which they use it to access a lot of different things. And these are the assignments that they basically stated they use it for. And you can see it has prevalent use across many different resources. <clears throat> Next, we'll go to the second part of the survey, which is the teacher survey. This teacher survey was conducted or completed by 598 teachers, approximately 33% of our teachers in grades pre-K to 12. These next two slides show that the teachers perceive the students are able to perform the nine digital skills. The digital learning plan was framed on nine skills that we're trying to teach students. These slides show that the teachers thought the students had the capacity to do these skills. This slide shows the teachers had a very favorable transition to the one-on-one -on -one environment for being the first year. It also shows the iPad is viewed as a very reliable instructional tool that has increased resources and positively impacted instruction. When the teachers were asked if they would prefer a different device, those who said yes ranged from 28% to 54% based on the level, with the higher level being at the high school. Of those who said yes, they, the majority preferred the MacBook, as with the students. And as with the students, when they stated the reason for a different device, the main reason if they would have one would be uh, typing followed by storage. We also had a lot of teacher comments on the listening sessions and teacher comments throughout the survey. And basically, the overall teacher comments were that they had several askings. One was for more devices in the primary levels. One was, again, reiterating a need for keyboards. And one was, again, uh, a desire for more capacity to manage student devices in the classroom. Good evening. Next two slides are going to highlight some tasks that we have completed during this past summer. Uh, we replaced some old iPad 2s at two different schools. Uh, we've installed <coughs> Wi-Fi in every classroom. Uh, we've installed a new firewall to enhance our network protection. We've also purchased laptops for our high school science departments, along with cords and chargers for all schools. We also realigned our self-service portal to match our nine digital learning capacities. The next two slides, I'm going to highlight some work we have planned for the coming school year. Uh, we're going to purchase keyboards for all of our content teachers, grades three through 12. We're going to purchase new iPads for teachers as they complete professional development on Apple's Classroom app. And we will redeploy old iPads as appropriate. We're also going to vary the way that we restrict websites based on grade levels. We're also working on new processes to acquire iPad apps and to open currently restricted websites. We will also provide additional professional development to our high schools. And last but not least, we'll be sitting back up here before probably not too long with the digital plan 3.0. And that team will be a, a, it will be a team effort to move that forward, which will include informational technology, library media, and the Office of School Improvement designed for professional development. At this point, we'll field questions in regards to our findings, efforts, and the like. Questions? Mr. Reidner. Ms. Not, you said, it says here purchase chargers and cords for, for schools or for, did we get them for the kids? I mean, the, some schools haven't gotten them yet. Some students have not gotten those yet. 
Okay, I'd be happy chargers, to follow up chargers. with all that. All schools were distributed bricks and chargers uh, based on their requests and uh, based on their population. I know one family that told me that, that they have not gotten those yet. Cool. Well, I'd be you. happy to follow up. Everyone received an original, what we're calling a brick and a charger to start with, with the original iPad. <clears throat> What we're discovering is the kids are quickly using these also for their iPhones if they have those or other Apple devices uh, that use that same charger. We're also seeing that these things wear out over time. So initially we had this as a school responsibility to replace what we're looking at being a consumer <coughs> item like bricks and cords. But it, in this initial second year, it just wasn't reasonable for schools to pick up that um, additional costs, so we picked that up as well as a substantial number of keyboards. <clears throat> Mr. Alton mentioned er earlier uh, keyboards for classroom teachers, and uh, I think he meant classroom sets of keyboards for classroom teachers. So they will have groups of 20 or 25 keyboards available to them in the classroom for all of their students have access to those. So all those things are in the works. We've ordered all those things, and they're, they're on their way or should have them by now. But the chargers... Dr. Michael, the chargers and the cords. On the original purchase, every iPad came with a charger and a cord that the child got and received last year. When we recollected those this year, we, you know, we're missing thousands. I think would be accurate. Or we're, we're approximately we're twenty five hundred is what they requested. How many? Approximately twenty five hundred, and we pushed so out almost double that amount. We're replacing those and making them available. So we're pushing out the new iPads or reassigning iPads. So, Mr. Ratner, what I hear you saying is somebody did got their iPad but didn't get a charger. Yeah. Okay. That's got to be. don't have a charger. Yeah. Now, do the chargers, the chargers go with the iPad home right. so that they can be charged outside of the school day. But, yeah, there's, you know, apparently some of these kids returned the chargers last year and they haven't gotten them yet. At, you know, at, at, I don't want to say the school, but, it, you know, I'll tell you later. Yeah. Mike, we'll check in. Sure. Okay. sure, I'd be happy to follow but up. But they, they do not have them. So Plans. something happened from the time frame of returning them to the open of school, and the school has not distributed them, or I don't know what's happened. So I'll, I'll talk to you about that. I don't want to mention the school. Mrs. Snow, I just wanted to know, what is the difference in price between a MacBook and an iPad? I don't I have the latest price quote on a MacBook. I will tell you that an iPad is now down to $300. MacBooks, for student MacBooks with the 11-inch screen, the last time I knew were hovering right around $775. But they have the Adobe Flash Player that's needed? They would have an Adobe Flash Player, yes. And, the, and giving the high school science teachers, does that address that concern? It did address the concern that was raised to us, which was mainly was with the demos and those pieces. Yeah. So we did give all the science departments uh, laptops to support the Adobe Flash demonstrations and a little bit of a, um, they also wanted a little bit of uh, higher functioning in, in the Excel. So we made sure that was supported as well with those laptops. We have some probeware that works with the science equipment that will only work on the PC device right yeah. now unless we purchase new, new places. All right, I have a question, Z. Um, okay, go ahead, Mr. Victor. Uh, just wondering if you were surprised by anything after reading the survey, because to me it looks like the biggest difference is with the high school numbers. Is there any explanation for for them seeming to have lower numbers than everybody else? I, I think that's one of the reasons we're going to target the PD there is one. But I would also state that the uh, the infiltration of the one to one devices and the frequent uh, the the number of devices we had distributed, we had a higher distribution rate of devices prior to the digital learning plan in the lower ranking grades, specifically the middle school and the elementary. I think they had a lot more years under their belt if you look across the board on the one-to-one. -one. So um, I think that also led to a lot of the reasons why the high school's not had as much experience. I also believe as the students infiltrate the high school as they flow up through the system using the same device or slight device, that that'll actually pay tremendous dividends as the students get up into those grades. Particularly that those numbers will climb. I think, yeah, and I think the teachers just, uh, that's one of our efforts is to really target the teacher support and provide more online support. Um, we provided a lot of um, virtual support last year, uh, virtual trainings, and I think a lot from what I heard from the high school teachers in the survey was very clear to me that they still prefer more of a traditional instruction. They want hands-on. They want a person in front of them. They want to actually see that that experience as opposed to doing a virtual virtual training. Okay. Mr. Ridenow. Well, 
just if you remember correctly in our first iteration of this plan last year one of the things that we wanted was different devices in in the high schools the macbook which is much more um, you know they need it to tell you the truth for the writing for graphing and some other things macbook is much more appropriate than an ipad uh, and i still think that's the case i you know and i agree with you in some respects that you know high school i don't know if high school teachers are reluctant to use ipads or not but i don't think they're as appropriate as a macbook the macbook is much more you know it's it's a better device for a high school student than an ipad um, so i hope it, you know it's it's not i don't believe an ipad's ideal for high school i do think it's great what's happening in the elementary schools and my god you know my niece had something published from my great niece had something published from emma k daub uh, a movie that she made about school atmosphere and rules and and everything else you know that she developed on an ipad in the, you know in the second grade so uh, you know i think there's great benefit from that at those two levels but high school i still believe you know we need to get a more sophisticated device for for the majority of those students because that's what they're going to be using you know it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a macbook or something even more sophisticated you know as they move on in their educational and, and i think you know if we can get to a point that we can afford to make that change you know that, that some of those wear out so instead of getting ipads to replace those we start replacing the uh the ipads in the high schools with macbooks particularly for the you know the kids that are you know more sophisticated and and need that as their education moves forward so i hope that as we move from 2.0 to 3.0 or whatever how many pointos we go that that we take that into consideration in our next iteration because i think that's that's important i think it's important to consider all aspects i remember the digital learning plan uh what you iterated was no different than the contention that the teachers they had going back and forth they went back and forth a lot on that topic uh, and specifically at the high school level not so much in the lower yeah, levels exactly. so it, it is a debatable topic that has people that have strong sides strong opinions on both sides and i'd be happy to explore that as directed thank you anyone else um i have a couple questions <clears throat> was this um were the surveys both for the teachers and the students were they random samples or did everyone have the opportunity and these are just the numbers of folks who took advantage of the opportunity to complete a survey we do have a breakdown by school and participation but i will share with you that it did go out to all schools it, it was went communicated out with all principals and some schools because uh, it was later towards the end of the year in which some devices had been consumed in the testing and things like that uh -huh. we even printed for example qr codes to schools so they could take it on their own byod so a student could just walk down a hall and, and scan it on a uh, and take the device, take the survey as well so we provided multiple opportunities i feel like we made a collective effort to get across to every school and it was offered to every school okay thank you um and then with regard to the restricted sites did did um the students give any indication as to the type of sites that you know mm -hmm. were they these sites that they wanted to do research on or the most it's prevalent okay. conversation came actually with the student government when we did a listening session with those mm -hmm. and it was the advanced students specifically in ib programs or the like who said that they were trying to do research and advanced research and they found that a lot of the sites that they thought that would be the most benefit to them were inaccessible yeah, inaccessible okay and um you know i agree with um my colleague over here mr Ridner, with regard to um the need for having um a MacBook or a Chromebook for high school students, and I'm wondering, um, looking at you know the thoughts of um, providing primary grades with iPads, if there's any possibility of moving down iPads that we've purchased for high schools to some of those primary grades, and then systematically moving MacBooks, Chromebooks, whatever into you know you've done science classes perhaps slang or english language arts or something along those lines is that the kind of thinking that you're doing or 
Well, I, no. I'm willing to hand that to me. I mean, I think it's important to remember that the first digital learning plan was run by teachers. Uh, right. So, and I would encourage, you know, that if we move it down, whichever format we move and whatever you want to consider, that we go the same way with teachers being at the center of those decisions. Uh -huh. And I'd be willing to, to navigate that or have others help navigate that process to, to see what the, would best guide us in that decision okay. as directed by Dr. Michael. Okay. Of course, our, our challenge with that to some degree is the purchase price, uh, right. particularly if we went with MacBook. Right. Um, you know, our students are familiar with the Apple product as they move up through the grades over time. Uh, while we'd like to be able to provide that, you know, probably be well in <coughs> our purchases to have those for seniors. Uh, so just something we need to explore. Maybe we need to look at another device. Uh, we're frequently having that, that mm -hmm. conversation. That conversation. Yep. And to the and second, then, I'm sorry, and to no, the second part, Ms. Williams, that you shared about the primary, I would just say, just to use a little caution, because there's also a, a lot of people out there that do have consi uh, considerable concerns about screen time in the primary grade. So it's kind of that, just be that discussion we need and, to weigh and, right. and checks and balances as we move forward. And, and mm -hmm. you know, I, maybe I should have said the elementary school where the need is not necessarily focus on the primary grades, because I do agree that you know there's a an appropriateness to the <laughs> age appropriate. Um, and then my last question um, has to do with the continued ongoing work um, planned for this year, where it says developing a new workflow to expedite requests to open new websites and download new apps that are aligned to the curriculum. Can you explain a little bit about what that process is for having those things approved? Is that sure? So. Specifically, right now, we're still developing the workflow for the websites, uh, although it is a work that we, we can go and do have to do a quick, pretty quick process. But we want a more detailed workflow. For the applications themselves, for the apps the, the teachers want, uh, they actually go to the, they complete a work ticket just like you would for any other problem with your technology. That goes down to the uh, technology office in which they then decide if it's content specific or if it aligns to the nine digital skills, trying to keep with a system-wide lens. Uh, if it's content specific, it now goes to the content specialists for each curriculum of each of the curriculums so they can actually see if it aligns to the practices we know that we want students to be engaged in. And they also can reach out to the teacher individually and say, hey, how exactly how are you going to use this for those types of things? Uh, the nine capacities goes to Mr. Kevin Tresler, who then vets that to see if it aligns to the, the digital skills we're trying to teach students. And then it goes back to IT in which they do a process. Uh, right now we've said five, we allow five business days for those uh, that process to go through for an application. Uh, for the um, restricted sites, I think the biggest gain we're trying to do is create a different level based on elementary, middle, and high, so that's the level of filtration is not at the highest level. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're currently filtering at a K to 12, with a K to 12 lens, as opposed to looking at high school possibly different. So we want to really gain some mobility on that. And then they can also submit requests for uh, websites, in my understanding, and they can also override websites as well. That's something they can always have done. However, if they want it opened up uh, for the system, they can also submit those requests as well. And those are usually handled pretty quick. We don't have an abundance of those requests. I was going to uh, say, Bob, I think we call that whitelisting a website. Is that mm -hmm. what that's referred to? So as we find websites that are really good websites, if for some reasons we've tightened our filter mm -hmm. that are blocked, that we'll, we'll open a website you know, manually. I don't quite want to say it that way. But we identify websites that are frequently used that are websites we want to allow through the filter. And you know we've been back and forth on this filter. As we open it up, all of a sudden we have things that we don't want to have mm -hmm. available to any student. As we tighten it up, then we tighten up uh, sites that uh, you know are res too restrictive. And of course, there's all the time people playing with the the web for for mm -hmm. reasons that aren't educational. So it's just kind of constantly that's something we work on. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, thank you, gentlemen. Thank, thank you very much. We'll move on to our summer school report. Good evening, President Williams, Dr. Michael, members of the board. Um, this evening, Dr. Akers, Mr. Poo, and I are going to share with you an update from our 2017 programs and operations. Um, we realized that this past summer was the longest we faced in a long time. It was 13 weeks from beginning to end. Um, recognizing that we needed to keep the students active <coughs> and engaged, uh, we looked at some additional efforts across the county and at each of the different levels in elementary, middle, and high uh, to do some different programs and opportunities for the kids. 
Uh, at the uh, district level, we started some additional programs this year where we really tried to keep literacy as a focus. Uh, we began our summer reading program with the iPad checkout where students were encouraged to um, go to their school, check out an iPad for the summer, and the iPads were loaded with resources and materials that they could use to stay engaged with their learning across uh, the summer. We had over 1,200 uh, iPads signed out. Um, a lot of our summer programs, too, also uh, encouraged students to use their own devices so they didn't have to check out a school-based device and they could still get access to some of the materials. Uh, we partnered with Washington County Library for the RAILS program. Uh, RAILS stood for raising, stands for Raising Access to Improved Literacy. And really what this was was a collaborative effort to encourage students to uh, become active with, with the local library to access materials and resources both online or in person at any of the library sites. Uh, we provided access to Flipster Digital Magazine, which uh, allowed for students to have uh, high interest uh, reading materials such as National Geographic and Sports Illustrated for Kids. Um, and we got a lot of uh, responses from that, and we're hoping that will continue to grow. Uh, we also had the Capstone eBooks program, which was part of the summer reading. Uh, this was an online program that allowed students to have access to leveled text that was at their level and at their high interest level, <coughs> excuse me, so that they could continue to, to increase in their reading abilities and their opportunity to read and access materials over the summer. And if you look at the numbers there, you can see that uh, over 10,000, almost 11,000 titles were viewed across um, the 13 weeks. And then finally, we had an iParent portal, portal that we opened up, and we we're encouraging parents to access uh, frequently and often. Um, we had a lot of parent access over the summer to the summer learning programs, as well as parents um, accessing resources and materials to use for summer learning at home. Um, and there's even training videos in there that parents can access that allow them to see how to use things like Google Sites and other types of programs and apps that uh, encourage the engagement as well. At the elementary level, we continued to run our summer school program. Uh, this program ran for three weeks. Over the course of the month of August, from August 7th through the 24th, we ran Monday through Thursday uh, with uh, 12 total instructional days. It was a countywide focus of literacy and math, and really looking at increasing that school readiness for the 17-18 school year, um, and looking at that uh, regression that we see over, over the summertime and trying to avoid the, the learning loss over the summer. It's a school-based program, so it allows students, uh, I'm sorry, allows schools to uh, plan and develop programs to meet their individual needs. Um, and each school developed what we call an individualized target program goal. They looked at their groups of students and they were developing the goals based off of their needs. And they, became, they developed beginning and end assessments to see if the students either maintained some of their, um, their success from the end of the year and getting ready for the school year to begin. Some additional summer school information. Uh, we served breakfast at all the sites and lunch was offered at most sites for the kids that attended. We did have transportation for our Title I schools coming from, our, from, from various community hubs. Um, schools were tasked with targeting anywhere from 10 to 15 percent of their student population to attend. And I'm very excited to report that we had over 1,100, uh, we had 1,150 students attend summer school across all of our elementary summer school sites with an 80 percent attendance rate, which is uh, 1,150 is the highest we've had, at least uh, for the 12 years I've been in the system. Uh, so we're really excited about that. We're really excited that we were able to provide some good focused summer school programs for students who needed that additional boost. Um, and then, again, I mentioned earlier that the programs were measured by those individualized targeted goals <clears throat> and that they looked at the beginning and end of, of, those, of that program days and determined whether or not students were able to be successful at that time. Finally, uh, realizing that even though we were able to impact 1,100 students for summer school, uh, the elementary principals and myself, we realized that there were still thousands of students that we needed to try to reach and engage. So we uh, continued to um, really promote and encourage some additional summer learning activities. Um, this is just an example of some activities that we had over the summer. This is definitely not a, a full comprehensive list. Many of, the summer, many of the school sites did multiple things over the summer. Uh, but some of the examples I wanted to share tonight, um, Fountaindale continued to run their, their STEM camp in June. It's a two-week camp. Uh, they had 60 students over the course of two weeks participate in science, technology, engineering, and math projects, which I got a great response. I went to the end of their camp uh, program, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, we had some multiple school-based reading programs, such as the Clear Spring. Uh, had a weekly reading night on Wednesday nights at the Clear Spring Library. They had uh, guest readers that were there. The students were excited. They had a, a huge response and a huge turnout. Uh, Fountain Rock did open library media nights. Malkinsville did a Google Classroom summer virtual learning where students were interacting with their teachers over the summer and were able to access this uh, Google Classroom either on the school iPad or a personal device. Um, Hickory had books on the go where they are going out to the community 
uh, taking books uh, out to the students and meeting them in, the, in their various community areas and uh, leaving with books in students' hands, um, as well as they ran a STEM cafe uh, um, throughout the summer. We had multiple sites run pre-kindergarten and kindergarten camps where we encouraged students, four and five-year-old students, especially new to school, coming in uh, to, to see the building, meet some of the teachers, meet the administration, and parents were also given resources for um, talking about early learning and where to help with developing their kids for school. Um, finally, we had some community nights held at all the schools, at libraries, at parks. Um, I was amazed at the number of activities that were happening across the system over the summer. I'm very excited about it. And last, uh, we did partner with the Washington County Free Library and the Hagerstown Sons uh, to promote their summer reading programs that they had that encouraged students to be actively involved with reading. And they had some incentives through both the programs, um, going to the Sons games. Uh, they had some uh, incentives that the, the library provided. And kids really got excited about those programs and opportunities. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Akers, who's going to speak to the secondary schools. Thank you. Uh, on the middle, in the middle school, we reestablished uh, summer school. Uh, we have not had summer school for a few years in middle school. Uh, and we focused on uh, uh, identifying students who could use some additional help in English, uh, reading, and math. Uh, but we provided uh, not only uh, the, the English and math, we offered a variety, in order to attract students, we offered a variety of uh, career technology uh, experiences. Uh, physical education, art. It varied a little bit from school to school, uh, what they felt they could offer uh, to attract students. Uh, we also had a traveling uh, CT or career technology education program uh, to come out and let kids experience uh, um, working with drones uh, and uh, some experience with robotics. So that was really designed, I think, just to make it more attractive. Uh, we were able to uh, as you can see from the slide, uh, have 263 students. We were hoping for significantly more than that, but uh, for our first year of uh, reestablishing the program, um, you know, it was pretty good. And uh, we're, we're going to be meeting to look at the uh, evaluation data that teachers uh, uh, did with the English and the math to see how effective it was, but also look at uh, ways of attracting more students to uh, attend over the summer. Uh, looking at high school, uh, high school uh, is five weeks long. The middle school program was four weeks long. Uh, we had uh, a central location over at the Washington County Technical High School campus, including uh, Antietam Academy. We also had three major uh, satellite locations at, at Boonesboro North and South. you look at uh, the, this table, you can see we had what, at least in my time here, uh, is I think a record 805 students earned credit this summer. Uh, you can see that we offered both traditional learning where students attended every day, Monday through Thursday. Uh, and then we had blended learning where students attended one or two days a week and did the rest of their work uh, online. Uh, through various programs, primarily the APEX programs. Um, you can, you know, there's a breakdown there about uh, locations, but it also tells you what the success rate is. That is the number of, the percentage of students who were enrolled um, who were successful in earning their credit. And you can see that uh, the traditional and blended are very close. Um, to each other uh, in the in the mid to high 70% uh, range uh, in both, which is really uh, excellent. A few facts about the high school summer school: uh, we had 23 different high school uh, courses that uh, we offered this summer. Uh, the highest enrollment in a traditional learning course was 87 students in physical education, uh, and and in blended, it was 66 students earning credit in health and life skills. And that points to one of the unique changes. I think the reason the numbers are up so much for students earning high school credit in the summer is that it used to only be students who had fallen behind who were primarily taking courses. Now students who want to get ahead uh, are taking summer school courses, opening up space in their schedules for um, 
taking more advanced courses or just courses they're interested in. Uh, we also had 31 students who were able to graduate this year because they were able to complete some coursework they needed to make up over the summer. In addition to our middle school and summer school, uh, middle, middle school and high school summer school, we had a couple of camps, uh, one being the uh, STEM camp. Uh, we had 67 ninth graders uh, participate in that. Uh, again, they were involved with robotics, drone flight applications, engineering, forestry. They had projects in all those areas that they did. Um, and then we had the an AP Environmental uh, Science Camp, um, which was actually like an overnight event at uh, the outdoor school. And uh, they were actually were out on the water wing canoes and, and conducting research out there on water quality and and various other projects. And with that. Thank you, Dr. Akers. On the school operations side, while the students and teachers were busy uh, working on uh, keeping up the rigor to enter into the new school year, the operations side was supporting that uh, through transportation services and food nutrition services. And from a facilities and maintenance perspective, uh, really working on our buildings, making sure that they're maintained well uh, upgraded as is necessary. I'm going to walk you through some of that. So from a facilities perspective, we undertook 19 improvement projects this summer. You can see there from the slide, uh, those are just some, some large buckets uh, that each of those projects fell into. And I'll run you through a couple of slides just to give you a sense of what this looks like. So uh, from an HVAC uh, perspective, this slide is uh, two photos from the work at uh, Hancock Middle Senior High School, sort of an interior and exterior look of the same space. So as you notice in the ceiling, you've got large ductwork, which is infusing the new conditioned air into that gymnasium. And above it is the rooftop unit that is supplying that air. So you get a sense of what it looks like uh, in all phases. Uh, Boonsboro Elementary is one school you may have known uh, that we've talked about previously that was right up to the wire in terms of getting ready, that was working on an HVAC project as well, uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Uh, the center photo sort of depicts some of the, the drastic change. So this is a building that had uh, through the wall univent systems there along the, the edges of the classroom underneath the windows. So uh, by going to a ducted system, uh, we also allowed additional casework uh, where we used to have air conditioning systems. So additional storage in the classroom is provided as part of that, uh, part of that project. Uh, South High had a couple of projects. We've got a new emergency generator at South High to maintain services uh, during a, a power outage, but we also replaced the, the roof material on half of the roof. And you may recall we uh, presented to you last week on the CIP program uh, to do the other half of the roof in the coming years. Fountain Rock also is, uh, I believe, also under a, a partnership with their PTA. We added uh, uh, the outdoor space as well as a walkway uh, to that pavilion. And then a sense of what some of the interior projects look like. So the left is a new health suite uh, at Springfield Middle School. We have uh, new handicap accessible restrooms at Clear Spring High School. Uh, and as you may recall, last summer we filled in the lower level of the cafeteria at E. Russell Hicks. Uh, it was a, a tiered cafeteria, uh, what we affectionately called the pit. We filled that in, leveled the, the space off, and we finished that flooring project, which also included an, an asbestos abatement this summer. On the food service side, we really think of summer food service in, in, in three large areas relating to summer schools, park and recreation programs, and mobile meals uh, in terms of how we serve our community. So from a, a summer school perspective, as you can see from the chart, we've got a comparison for you of 2016 to 2017. Uh, as uh, Mr. Semler and Dr. Aker shared with you, we had large increases in the number of students that were attending summer school, and that parlayed into additional numbers of students partaking in meal programs where you have a 20% increase at breakfast and a 30% increase at lunch. Due to the length of the summer, uh, we saw similar increases as well, of course, uh, in participation in our community sites. Uh, so community sites might be programs we partner with uh, the Boys and Girls Clubs or YMCA where they're running camps out in the community and we are a vehicle for them to provide meal services to the students while they're in their care throughout the summer. Uh, and lastly, our mobile meal program that we've talked with numerous times over the last couple of years, our meal machine, uh, getting out in the community. And the, the photo actually to the right depicts sort of uh, enrichment activities that we include with summer meals in the mobile setting, uh, where this particular one is a, a thespian group that travels around in the summer and just use, does little skits. 
Uh, they attended uh, many of our sites. We've also worked with the mobile dental clinic, the, uh, the bookmobile, uh, and other services to uh, provide some sort of enrichment for the students when they come from the meal. But it is you know, sort of a double-sided draw. These groups want our students. Uh, our students also want more than just the meal when they come to the site. So it's really been a great partnership. On the maintenance side, uh, you've got a breakdown, again, in terms of large categories of work orders that were done over the summer by our maintenance and operations team. Uh, just about 2,800 work orders were done by our maintenance team over the course of the summer. Again, delivering product, making mechanical repairs, structural repairs, electrical upgrades at the schools, buildings and grounds programs, uh, just to make sure that everything is in tip-top shape when our students returned uh, the Monday after Labor Day. Uh, and finally, on the transportation side, you know, we can't get rolling and can't get the kids where they are without the big yellow buses. Uh, we operated 59 buses, of our own buses, outside of contractor buses this summer uh, for a total of 77,000 miles that they ran. And while our garage staff performed 255 work orders on buses and another 51 on fleet vehicles, and we also did a bus inspection this summer right before school opened on 50, an additional 56 contractor buses. Uh, so staff was clearly out busy during the summer supporting the schools, supporting learning, uh, and making sure that the buildings were ready. And with that, I think we can take any questions you may have. My wife said, sent me a text said, you could hear my knuckles cracking. <laughs> so I turned it off to kind of try to keep that from occurring. That's your fault, right? So I owe you. But anyway, the funding for most of those projects, the summer projects, uh, where did that come from? So some of the projects were through state CIP. Some of the projects are also funded locally out of WCPS dollars. Uh, we actually shifted some dollars this year through local CIP to sustain projects for the future. So in terms of local CIP this year, those were funded out of uh, WCPS operating funds. Yes, and, and my point, and I knew that, to be truthful with you, but my point was that you know this is something we're dealing with now for how many years, Dr. Michael, have we had to do this? Uh, we received five hundred thousand dollars from the county last year. The year before, zero, and anticipated for this year, zero dollars. Yeah. So at least so every four. every project now is coming from our operating funds, which means we have less to do other things. Um, so I would invite our partners who we just signed a contract with to join us and and make a plea to uh, county commissioners because uh, two years ago I tried and it didn't go very far. Um, to get that money, uh, to cover, you know, have them cover nurses, uh, crossing guards, and other things, so that we can have that extra money to match what the state was willing to give us. How much, Dr. Mike, would you say in the last three years, have how much? A total of five hundred thousand dollars from the county CIP. Right. Traditionally, it's been much higher. We're working with the county staff to try to improve that for the future. But how much would, did we lose if we hadn't done this with our operating funds? Uh, we wouldn't have been able to submit for the four and a half million we received two years ago, and the two and a half million we received this year. So we would have lost out on seven million dollars had right. we not supported it with local dollars. And that's my point. You know. We are losing out. We're having to use money from an operating budget. That shouldn't have to happen. Those are things that could go into programs. Um, you know, we could buy a heck of a lot of computers with $7 million. You know, we could, we could hire a few more teachers. We could easily um, find ways to include more kids in our pre-K if we have $7 million to find space, to help us find space. So every year that we get zero from the county, you know, is, is a significant amount of money that we have to pull from other areas. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we have to think about that in the future. Um, and again, you know, we got a deaf ear turned to us two years ago when I pleaded, you know, for the county commissioners to give us funding for, for crossing guards, uh, nurses, and everything else so that we could have that money to to apply to different areas. So thank you for, for the information. It's, it's just, it's a frustrating, it's frustrating for me that this continues. Thank you. That's the end of my report. Unless there's okay. other questions. Anyone else have a question? Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Thank you very much.
brings us to the superintendent's update. Dr. Michael. I have no other comments from the scene. Uh, as, well, I will mention tomorrow we do have uh, Promise Pathway Program with HCC, one of our partners. I'm excited to participate in that. Last night I had the opportunity to participate in the Maryland Municipal League uh, group. Had a great uh, evening with them as well as stop by our advanced learner program. We're off to a great start of the school year. Uh, enrollment's about what we projected it to be and I, I think things are going very well. And pretty soon we'll be more than a month into the school year. It's hard to believe. It's hard to believe. Next agenda item is personnel action. Dr. Bishop. Good evening, Dr. Michael, Mrs. Williams, Mr. Stauffer, and board members. As discussed earlier in closed session, there are several staff changes for your review. At this time, I ask for your approval of today's personnel actions. Thank you. Is there a motion? Yes, Madam President. Um, Move to accept the personnel actions as presented to the board earlier today. Thank you, Mr. Ridenary. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Stauffer. Any questions? Discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor of approval of the personnel actions as presented this afternoon. Okay, five affirmative votes. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Bishop. Okay, that brings us to committee reports. Mr. Ryan, now would you like to begin? I'd like to find what I had from this oh, morning. They want us to start at the other. Yeah, Good? No, it's, okay. It's, uh, uh, the HR committee did meet this morning shortly. Uh, part, of the, part of the meeting dealt with uh, being introduced to a new staff. We have several people. You know, the staff was changed pretty significantly. Um, and we uh, had an opportunity to meet, learn what their responsibilities are. Uh, and we will meet again uh, next month to, and we'll get a, a little heads up on the HR report that's going to pre be presented to the board uh, in November. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Stauffer, I believe you have some reports to present. Yeah, filling in for Mrs. Uh, <clears throat> Mrs. Fisher, uh, the policy committee met on September 19th. And uh, we dealt with the uh, uh, local funding of school lunch, which was addressed here this evening. Uh, the policy committee is working very uh, diligently on, uh, you know, dealing with that uh, controversial issue and, uh, and so forth. We also uh, received uh, review comments, received on the first reading of the uh, proposed policy JICI, the policy on administration of naloxone, naloxone, how you pronounce that, I'll never learn how, or other overdosing reversing medications and so forth. Uh, we also uh, dealt with several uh, policies that were rescinded here tonight, or at least up for uh, reading, and that would be the school census, the adult admission to the Career Study Center, the uh, discussion on the resolution relative to student rights and responsibilities. And uh, there was a discussion for a future uh, policy meeting about is there a need for a policy that covers public-private partnerships that do not involve construction activity. I might add that these uh, minutes will be available uh, online if you want to look at them. The next meeting of the committee, uh, meetings of the committee will be October the 10th and October the 24th uh, at 9.15 a.m. And I would add that they are open to the public and you may come and uh, participate in the discussion and so forth. And then uh, let me get this up here on my iPad. Uh, going in for Mr. Gessford, uh, who had another uh, event tonight. Uh, the facilities committee uh, met on September uh, 13th, excuse me, and they discussed the Hagerstown Urban Revital Revitalization Project or the Urban Improvement Project, as some people call it and so forth. Uh, those meetings uh, 
you know, the school board has uh, said we're in it for $4 million. There's a lot of discussion about the uh, bridge connecting uh, the uh, new academic building downtown to the university systems, uh, new university systems building and so forth. But we discussed all that. We talked more about the uh, Sharpsburg Elementary replacement project and the changes that have been made by the architect due to comments made uh, as a result of comments made here in open session a few uh, meetings ago and also uh, comments that they received from the uh, uh, people at a uh, at a meeting held at Sharpsburg Elementary School uh, for the public and so forth. Uh, there was also uh, uh, discussion which Mr. Pru pretty much has discussed this evening already about the uh, summer projects that were uh, that were finished. Uh, report on uh, we discussed the community project at uh, Boone's Bar High School in which the Nora Roberts Foundation is uh, if memory serves me correctly, contributing over half the amount, I believe, for the uh, reconstruction, I'll call it, of the auditorium down there. Uh, also, Milestone Communications, which is uh, proposing to build a cell tower on the property that uh, North Hagerstown High School, from which the uh, school board would get uh, revenue from. Uh, they're proceeding with uh, finalizing timelines and posting community hearings. They will handle all that. Uh, we are not into, in, into that in that session. They're, they're responsible for doing all of that. And then there was an update uh, by uh, Mr. Criswell about uh, two, uh, two other developments uh, concerning the villas at Gateway and one called uh, Paradise Heights. And uh, Mr. Mills, Mr. Mark Mills, the head of maintenance and so forth, uh, gave a comprehensive maintenance plan and a work order summary report, which was uh, talked about a little bit here already this evening. And uh, deferred maintenance uh, increased by approximately $10 million from last year's report. And I think uh, as Mr. Rodenauer has already reiterated, I believe it's Mr. Rodenauer made the comment that this is something that's been going on for quite a while. And, it needs to be addressed, and uh, I will say that the uh, uh, people at the CES who are concerned with that do uh, a very good job in addressing those needs, uh, as you saw from the summer projects that were done. There is no uh, time set for a new meeting as of yet. Okay, thank you, Mr. Stafford. Mr. Bickford. Finance Committee met bright and early this morning to discuss the uh, uh, results of the MSD audit, MSDE audit, which um, they passed with flying colors. I think there was only one thing that needed to be addressed. Everything else uh, went very well, and the, the one item has been addressed. And uh, the external audit is also underway. We talk about very exciting things at 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, and uh, we reviewed the fourth quarter budget adjustments, which will be presented for full board approval, I believe, at our next board meeting. And um, we are meeting again. Uh, we're actually going to meet in six weeks' time, um, and right before Thanksgiving, I believe it was Tuesday, November 14th, at 8 in the morning. Thank you, Mr. Bickford. Mrs. Murray. Yes, the Curriculum and Instruction Committee met on September 19th. And I would like to thank Mr. Semler and Dr. Henson for their early learning update. Our next meeting will be on October 24th at 10.30 a.m. in the board conference room. The student government had our first official meeting today. We had a whopping attendance of 75 people, which for our first meeting, that's actually pretty good. So we're looking forward to working with the Four Diamonds Association. That's a fundraising, um, that's, a, that's a nonprofit that deals with childhood cancer, and we're going to deal with that as a county initiative. And I think our next meeting is going to be in two months, so I'll let you guys know on that. Okay, thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is future agenda items. Um, we have coming up in October findings of the FY 2017 financial audit and single audit that um, was mentioned by Mr. Bickford. 
the 2016-2017 uh, student achievement, ACT and SAT data, um, the impact of planned residential developments on school enrollment. Coming up in November 2017-2018 student enrollment and free and reduced meal eligibility rates, human resource updates on new hires and new teacher academy. Also in November, the 2018-2019 high school program of studies. Mathematics tech book. Um, we have some um, topics that we still need to schedule. Uh, the budget advocacy and review advisory committee update, the finance and audit review advisory committee, and the diversity ad hoc committee update. Um, I'd like to remind my colleagues of a few dates, future dates. We had a work session today on board norms and board communication processes. We have a legislative uh, work session coming up on October 17th from 2 to 3. <coughs> uh, we'll be discussing our legislative work for this session. Um, we have scheduled, um, we don't have a time or a place at this time, a meeting with our state delegation. That's on December 5th. Um, there's another work session on November 7th, again from 2 to 3. That work session will be a presentation and um, uh, information getting on Frontline, which is being used for teacher evaluation and professional development. Uh, we have the Open Meetings Act training on December 8th at 9.30 here in the board auditorium. And uh, Mr. Becker and Dr. Michael have um, spoken to us uh, this evening about the Kerwin Commission hearing that is to happen in, um, at Frederick High School. It's LINX at Frederick High School. I'm not sure what LINX is. I forgot if that's what a, that stands if for. If it's a acronym. portion of the high school or if I it's... I think it's just the name of the high school. But it's it's the name of the high school? Okay, well, at Frederick High School, which is on Carroll Parkway. Um, that's Thursday, September 28th from 6.30 to 8.30. That public hearing is for parents, students, teachers, and any other interested individuals to share their views on improving the public education system in Maryland. Um, if you um, are interested in giving testimony or speaking, you need to uh, sign up in advance for that. And the commission is scheduled to give their final report um, and vote on uh, December 14th. So that's coming up soon. Um, anyone else have anything, any suggestions for future, future, excuse me, agenda items? You think that's enough? <laughs> when yes. are we scheduled to get a breakdown of having a discussion about health care costs? Um, I don't have my agenda planning folder We've been with me. I tried to do that about once a quarter or so, and I think I just got some information that I asked staff for me to explain it to me uh, okay. just in the last week or so. Okay. But we'll, we'll try to look at that maybe the next couple board meetings. So I think mainly we were going to try to look at some of the data we've been getting on what the bulk of the expenses have been categorized, right. correct? Okay. Right. Um, we will be back to um, our regular schedule of meetings, first and third Tuesdays, starting in October. And uh, the Agenda Planning Committee discussed, and, and this is all dependent on um, what we have um, work-wise about having just one meeting in December, which would be that first December meeting, the first. Like that. I think it's this. Yes, I think it's December fifth. Um, so, uh, so no suggestions for anything else. Mr. Stafford has decided we have enough on our plate right now. Plenty of future agenda items. So, if there's nothing else. Oh, I'm sorry. Board Would comments. you like to, to do comments this evening? Board member comments. I almost forgot. Mr. Ridenour, are you? Right you have. You, no. <laughs> you, you commented enough, you think? I think it's too much. Okay. <laughs> well, if you find that you think of something, we can certainly come back to you. <laughs> Mr. Stauffer. Uh, I'll be attending the uh, MAVE uh, convention or conference in Ocean City. 
I think it's the 4th, 5th, and 6th of October. Yes, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And uh, the worst part of that uh, event is going to be driving across the Bay Bridge at night, which I will hate, but I will get across that bridge somehow. Uh, two other things. Uh, I want to commend the staff and Dr. Michael for their efforts that they uh, did to avoid impasse. Uh, I was opposed to impasse. I didn't think enough had been done to, uh, with, by all the negotiating teams to bring that to a uh, successful conclusion. So I commend the superintendent and his staff for uh, doing what they did for the employee group because I truly believe that people who are appreciated do more than you expect of them. And if you don't appreciate them, they don't think they're being appreciated, they're not going to work uh, diligently to uh, do, their, do their job. And uh, the other comment I would say, we spend a lot of time in like, uh, and in the past talking about uh, technology. And I want to say that technology is certainly a vital tool in education, uh, especially going into the 21st century. I mean, we're almost two decades into it now and so forth. But I firmly believe that no device is ever going to take the place of a competent, caring teacher in the classroom. Technology is a tool. I think we should have the best that we can afford, but we still have to have those competent, caring teachers for that human contact and interaction in the learning process. Mr. Pickford. I have nothing. Mrs. Murray. Yes, I would just like to say thank you to Mrs. Patricia Kelly and the Hagerstown Lioness Club for their dedication to providing vision screening in our elementary schools. She recruited me last Thursday to help at Pangborn. It was a pleasure to work with them. They are a fine oiled machine. They get the kids in and out and do such a great job. And um, I really appreciate their efforts. And I am not going to comment this evening, so if there's nothing further, we'll adjourn. Thank you. Thank you.